Good afternoon. This is Kyle Welch with RCR Wireless News. I want to thank everyone for attending Thinking Big by Thinking Small, Keys to Successful Small Cell Deployments, presented by Goodman Networks. Our presenter today is Jeff Cocking, Director, Engineering and Deployment at Goodman Networks. Uh, just as a reminder, I want to let everyone know that within 24 hours of this webinar, we will provide you with a link to the on-demand version of today's webinar, including a white paper uh, presented by Goodman Networks as well. During the webinar, we encourage everyone to submit questions via the control panel, uh, which will be answered towards the end of the presentation. With that being said, at this time, I'd like to turn the presentation over to Jeff. Thanks, Cal, and welcome to the first of what we plan to be a series of webinars discussing the various aspects of small cells and HetNet deployment. In this webinar, we're going to focus on the service provider. From a customer perspective, we'll examine the 10 key things to look for when selecting a small cells integration partner. And from a services provider perspective, we'll look at those same 10 key areas that can be used as a checklist for company readiness as we move into what will be a complex, aggressive, and accelerated rollout challenge that, from a BTS or node point of view, is projected to double the size of many operators' networks over the next two to three years. Uh, first off, a short introduction to Goodman Networks. Goodman Networks is a TL9000 registered telecommunications services company that helps our customers design, engineer, construct, deploy, integrate, and maintain converging networks. Since its founding in 2000 by the five Goodman brothers, Goodman Networks has grown to become one of the largest end-to-end -end communication solutions providers in the United States. The growth of Goodman Networks is a reflection of our reputation for completing communications projects with industry-leading quality and on-time performance metrics. As a leader in the telecom services sector, Goodman Networks is committed to continual investment in its people, processes, and systems. In the past year alone, Goodman has grown from a 2012 revenue of over $700 million to a projected revenue of over $1.2 billion for 2013. In 2013, Goodman Networks also completed the acquisition of the services arm of Cellular Specialties Incorporated, or CSI, a leading DAS, Wi-Fi, and small cell services company. Multiband Corporation, a leader in engineering, installation, and maintenance services for direct TV and other service providers. And we also acquired the assets and workforce of Design Build Technologies, known as DBT, a full-service wireless construction company that builds and maintains communication towers for major network operators across the southeast U.S. Uh, additional information can be found on the web at www.goodmannetworks.com. Okay, so one of the reasons we're attending this webinar and why there's such a buzz in the industry is because of what we're reading in the press. Articles such as 98% of mobile operators say small cells are essential for the future of their networks. Small cells will make up almost 90% of all base stations by 2016. Demand from subscribers is forecast to increase 18-fold over the next few years. And LTE small cell shipments will surpass LTE macro base station shipments in 2014. Comments such as this were capped off with AT&T's Project VIP announcement that along with 1,000 DASs and 10,000 new macro sites, that they plan to deploy more than 40,000 small cells by the end of 2015. However, as attractive as all that sounds to those of us that service these customers, or for those of us that want to get into that game, the path to success isn't likely to be as straightforward as many may think. Stephen Bai, Sprint CTO, summed it up best in a speech he recently gave about the advent of small cells. In theory, it looks great, he said. However, the challenge is in the physical deployment. So before we go any further, let's take a look at the, a brief look at the need for why network transformation has come around, of which small cells and HetNet are parts, by looking at some industry trends. Subscriber thirst for data is forecast to exponentially increase over the next few years. Driving this growth is many factors, including such things as more services, more applications, and video-centric usage. On top of this, we're also seeing more mobile broadband users, more connected devices, and a greater usage of smartphones. But at the same time, we're also seeing from a consumer point of view that subscriber demands are increasing, user satisfaction is critically important, especially to retention of subscribers, and subscribers have zero tolerance for poor performance. In addition, networks face many challenges. Coverage gaps in low coverage or no coverage areas, deployment challenges, such as site acquisition, volume and scale, capacity demands from differing traffic types and user profiles, 
and making optimal use of the limited spectrum that they have available. And let's not also forget monitoring and management. This is becoming increasingly complex. The challenge facing wireless carriers today looking to improve the customer experience is getting a cohesive view of consumer and network behavior across the entire organization. This is becoming an increasing concern as many consumers move away from traditionally easy to track voice and messaging services and into more complex data interactions. In addition, the demands of shareholders for ever increasing returns on their investments is leading to cost saving initiatives that affect all functional areas. On the back of all these challenges, analysts are forecasting that the revenue per gigabyte that operators are seeing is projected not to grow proportionally to traffic growth, but that it will actually flatten over the next few years. What this means is that operators need to find new ways to reduce their cost per delivered gigabyte, and that means that they need to transform the way that they do business today. So what does all this mean from an operational perspective? Well, in no uncertain terms, wireless networks need to improve. They need to improve in terms of intelligence, automation, flexibility, resiliency, efficiency, capacity, speed, and latency. And they've got to do all this at a lower delivery cost. But the network is only one half of the equation. Not only does the network need to improve in all these areas, but so do we as service providers. So, so far we've acknowledged that small cells are going to happen. They're going to happen fast and in huge numbers. And that operators and service providers have to reduce the delivery costs. The next step is for us to take a look at some of the numbers that are being thrown around for small cells. So we'll take a large network operator as an example. I'm pretty sure you can get So I'm going to talk about. They're going to deploy by the end of 2014 approximately 40,000 small cells. They're going to probably deploy in 2013 about 5,000. This is mostly due to the lack of a product until later this year, and also they're still working out how they're actually going to do this. So let's say they do 5,000 this year. That means the remainder is 35,000 for the next two years. So if we exclude weekends and holidays, there are roughly 502 working days in 2014-2015. This means that our unnamed operator needs to deploy around 70 small cells a day to meet their stated goals, which sounds easy. One a day for 70 small companies, 10 medium companies doing seven a day, and so on. But that's not the case when you consider there are so many other activities that have to take place to deploy a small cell. It's not just about bolting this thing on the wall and turning it on. These things are base stations after all. Their actual small size is irrelevant. They still have to go through the same processes and due diligence that macro sites would. So initial timelines for these activities show phase one activities such as initial design, survey, feasibility analysis and approval taking approximately 60 days to complete. Phase two activities such as site acquisition, leasing, zoning, regulatory and provisioning taking approximately 90 days to complete and phase three activities such as installation, integration, testing, approval and closeout taking approximately 60 days to complete. So what this means is for an outdoor small cell from beginning to end it's going to take around 210 days to deploy. So think about that for a moment. If a single small cell has a 210 day timeline we've only got 502 days to deploy 35,000 of these things. So in order to be successful, the process for the majority of these outdoor sites, it will have to be up and running very, very early in 2014 to stand any chance at all of all 35,000 being ready by the end of 2015. Now, admittedly, the process for indoor small cells will be quicker because many of the challenges associated with outdoor deployments are lessened. However, indoor deployments are still likely to take at least two to three months to complete from start to finish. So it's clear from these timelines that one of the key competitive differentiators for service providers will be in their ability to demonstrate how they can minimize cycle time, or in other words, in this case, minimize that 210 day cycle period. So now that we've talked a little bit about the timelines, let's take a look at the financial landscape for small cells. In a recent leading analyst report, a table for the revenue per small cell per year was presented. The numbers were fairly consistent for each year, so by taking the average value, a forecast of the annual revenue an operator could expect from a small cell per year came out to be approximately $8,600. If we assume a typical microwave link as a targeted return on investment or ROI of 24 months, and a DAS as an ROI of, or say, between 36 and 60 months, it's fair to assume that a reasonable ROI for a small cell would be something around 36 months. So if we take those two numbers, as you can see on the screen there, this means that an all-in cost of a small cell needs to come in somewhere around twenty-five to twenty-six thousand dollars. 
But remember, that figure needs to cover everything. All the services, utilities, permits, leases, power, backhaul, and of course the small cell itself. And operating costs for those two years, three years. So some examples of the costs that are associated with a small cell are shown in the picture, but I'm sure you could add many more to this as well. So what does all this tell us? Well, first off, backhaul utilities and the small cell itself are going to take up a large amount of the available dollars. This means that services revenue on a per small cell basis is likely to be quite low. Secondly, to make any money in the small cell services sector, we're going to need three things. The first is volume, the second is cost efficiency, and the third is to provide as much of the end-to-end -end solution as we possibly can. In the past couple of slides, we've established there's a lot to do in a very short time frame and that there's not a whole lot of money to do it with. So for those of you that are still on the call and haven't abandoned all help of this being a good industry for us all, we'll turn to the question of, so how are we going to do this? Well, for most people, it's a natural progression to try to fit something new into a bucket that you've already got or something that you already know. 18 months or so ago, that was the prevailing thought when we looked at the various deployment models that we have in play, which ones would best fit small cells. But it became very quickly apparent that none of our standard deployment models would satisfy all the requirements. But all was not lost. Um, our existing models were developed over time to meet specific deployment needs, but many of the components within those models were consistent all were clearly transferable. The outcome was that we had to take the best of all our existing models and use them to create the foundational building blocks of a new and unique model for small cell deployment. So in the next few slides, we'll examine in more detail the 10 main characteristics of this model and discuss why they're critical to service solutions readiness and to being able to meet the future demands of our customers. The first characteristic to look for in a potential services partner is financial health. Now we're going to see several three-legged stools or rules of three as we go through the next few slides. For financial health, the main attributes to look for are strength, security and stability. As services providers, we have to be continually adapting to our environment and stepping up our service. What our customers desire today is expected tomorrow, basic the next day and frankly criminal the day after that. So this means we can't be living paycheck to paycheck, so to speak. Continuous improvement requires continuous investment. This investment drives innovation and expansion and allows ongoing development of our products and team members. Stability is the second leg of this particular stool. While financial strength allows us to innovate, develop and grow, financial stability demonstrates that we have a handle on our core business and we're able to deliver services that are repeatable and consistent. It's what I unofficially call the McDonald's model. McDonald's put immense time and effort and money into making sure that the Big Mac purchased in, say, Orlando tastes exactly the same as one purchased in Seattle or London, for that matter. Financial and operational stability also allows us to more accurately forecast ahead and leverage efficiencies, particularly in back office functions. Lastly, and an equally important leg of the financial stool is security. Financial strength and stability demonstrate sound financial health. This drives confidence in both employees and customers that the company's in the game for the long run. Our customers are looking for partners that are able to ride out the rough with the smooth and that they're invested in their business as much as they are. But they also want to work with partners who are able to stand by their obligations and commitments. Or in other words, do what they said they were going to do when they said they were going to do it. The services business is a people business. Our people are, in many cases, our product, and their intellectual knowledge is what differentiates us from our competitors. It's a fact that employees are considerably happier and more motivated when they know that their company is not only investing in their long-term growth, but also provides job security. Similarly, when that company is successful and financially healthy, it's got the means to be able to allow employees to share in that wealth as well. So, we've established that financial health is important. Next, we'll take a look at another characteristic that will undoubtedly be required for the rollout of any national program, and that's scale. Scale is an often used term in business and can have different meanings depending on the context. So, very much like the Apple folks like to say there's an app for that, as you can guess, we've got a three-legged stool for that. The first question is, are we operating our business at scale? Operating a business at scale means allocating and optimizing resources to drive the greatest results and volume. And this takes considerable cohesion between departments. I'm sure we've all seen the negative effects of silos within organizations. 
Many companies may have a single name and logo, but essentially they operate as tens or even hundreds of mini companies all under one roof, each out to protect its own profit or cost center and resources. And obviously this is not efficient. Each department needs to understand exactly how it contributes to the overall company goals and ensure that interdepartmental touch points and transitions are as smooth as possible. Put simply, operating the business at scale is about optimization, not duplication of effort. Scale is another word for size. Large, stable, strong and secure companies are able to leverage favorable agreements with suppliers. We said early on in this presentation that cost efficiency and volume is key to small cell deployment. Leveraging scale allows the service provider to maintain margins even with increasing volumes. Similarly, scale makes a company attractive to partners. Synergies can lead to new business opportunities and entrance into markets that were previously not available. In a high volume business such as small cells, companies that can leverage economies of scale will bring significant advantage when it comes to cost efficiency. Lastly, but certainly not least, is flexibility. A company that's got scale is able to add or decrease resources according to demand while keeping operating costs stable. A change in demand should not cause a linear, linearly corresponding change in operating costs. A considerable percentage of operating costs come from the support structures that back up the field resources teams. This area in particular should not see a significant cost variation as the business grows in order for a business to be able to claim that they're able to scale. One of the key things to look for in a company that can scale itself is a consistent and repeatable delivery model. The company that's got the greatest resource flexibility is one that's refined their product to the point that the work that's being delivered is fundamentally the same no matter where in the country it's being performed. More than three quarters of the US population shares just about 3% of the available land area. Unfortunately, that 3% is not contiguous. The top four populated urban areas, New York, LA, Chicago, and Dallas-Fort Worth, are just about as equally spread apart from each other as they can be from east to west, north to south. So in order to be able to provide a countrywide service like that of a national small cell rollout that needs to be face to face with our customers on a day to day basis, or in other words, a service that can't be delivered remotely, a service provider needs resources, well, nationwide. But this approach doesn't just extend to field resources. Thanks to the electronic age, wide availability of high bandwidth, low price internet connections, and the fact that most of our jobs, no matter what industry we're in, seem to revolve around conference calls, emails, and spreadsheets, many companies are reaping the benefits of having a geographically distributed workforce. But it all depends on the type of business and the implementation. Some good examples are Yahoo. Yahoo CEO Marissa Mayer earlier this year sent a memo asking all remote employees to return to work at the office which was the opposite of a work from home and flexible work schedule policy that she successfully implemented in her previous role at Google. She also said that people are more productive when they're alone, but she also continued, but they're more collaborative and innovative when they're together. Clearly the key for any company that wishes to successfully manage a distributed workforce is in their being able to satisfy both of those needs. The benefits of a, to our services business of a geographically distributed workforce are significant. We put our team members closer to customers. Travel time and costs are minimized. Local employees are able to bring local knowledge. We're able to invest in the community and form relationships with the communities we work in. Our support costs are reduced. Employee job satisfaction is improved. We become more agile and are able to respond to our customers' needs better. And lastly, it's environmentally positive. We're not flying people all over the place and tearing up the skies and the earth. Studies have shown some significant benefits of a successfully implemented distributed workforce include up to a 40% increase in program and return on investment, up to a 38% reduction in support costs, and up to an 18% increase in productivity. So a large distrib distributed workforce is another of the keys to being able to nationally deploy small cells, meet our objectives of reducing the operating cost per employee, while at the same time improving quality and customer satisfaction. So next we'll take a look at the fourth area in our services model, and that's self-perform. The macro wireless industry has historically been built upon large operator contracts that are typically awarded to either incumbent OEMs or large integrators. While they often self-perform the key parts that they specialize in, for example, base station integration, much of the field work is in turn subcontracted out to preferred technical partners, local mom and pops, or other regional general contractors. 
While this has suited a macro model with moderate volume and revenues per site for many years, more recently supply chain and the dreaded reverse auction have become increasingly dominant in the determination of who gets to perform the work. This is driven from what we spoke about earlier in this presentation about the need for operators to become more efficient to meet the demands of an exponentially growing traffic demand with flattening revenues. But unfortunately, in a supply chain dominated environment, competitive differentiation appears to be coming less from service delivery capability and more from the ability to be the lowest bidder. Now, this reminds me of a quote often attributed to the astronaut Alan Shepard. He said, it's a very sobering feeling to be up in space and realize that one safety factor was determined by the lowest bidder on a government contract. It's very true for our industry. Clearly, while the supply chains of the world are driven to prioritize the bottom dollar, the operators, engineering, sales, marketing, and delivery teams, and more importantly, the end users who use the systems we deploy, they require an uncompromising commitment to quality and performance, as well as a low price. This combination of optimizing cost with no compromising quality or performance is what defines the term operational efficiency. By self-performing as much of the work as possible, service providers are able to control as much of the delivery environment as they can and minimize their reliance on others to meet project goals. Now, there will undoubtedly be times when certain tasks are outsourced to specialist partners, particularly those who can deliver their services cheaper and better than if they were performed by the prime service delivery organization. However, a key to operational efficiency is built upon the service provider's ability to eliminate scenarios where margins are put on margins without adding any extra value to the end customer. Operational efficiency in a self-performed model is built around three interlinked components, ones you've probably seen many times before, people, processes, and tools. The advantages of a self-performed delivery model are extensive. It drives quality and quality control, allows us to give performance-based rewards to our employees, helps us adhere to standards and maintain consistency. We're able to drive safety. We're able to ensure we can strongly and easily del uh, deliver the same products throughout the country. We can control schedules. And because we can do all that, we're able to reduce cycle time. We're able to make sure our engineers are certified and qualified to work on the equipment they work on. And also at the same time, facilitate, facilitate knowledge transfer and training and development of these teams, which helps our employees grow while at the same time allowing us to maintain focus on the critical path for our customers. We're able to respond faster to challenges, and best for our customers is this one throat to choke. In other words, somebody who's singularly accountable and responsible for the end result. And this helps considerably with maintaining and improving the customer relationship. The next area of focus in our services readiness model is what we call intelligent services delivery, or ISD. The simplest way to describe an intelligent services delivery system is that it's all about putting the right skill set in the right place at the right time, every time. Now, while the definition may be straightforward, implementation of the model is less so. But the system starts and ends like all good models with the customer. Small cells, like any other mass manufactured, high volume, highly technical product, are not going to function out perfectly right out of the box without some level of human intervention. True HetNet capabilities of plug and play, self-organizing, self-optimizing, and self-healing are a long way from being realized. Small cells in the mid to near future are basically smaller versions of their big brothers and sisters, the macro BTSs. They're still going to require setting up, data fills, data translations, and firmware updates, for example, and there will likely be a number of out-of-box failures. So this first stage of the ISD model starts with a national transportation hub where all the units to be deployed are received, tested, staged, configured, and then shipped to site for installation. Now, while it may seem this stage will add extra cost to the process, our experience deploying large-scale femto cell and Wi-Fi solutions show that one of the worst things that can happen is for an install team to take a unit out of the box on site and not have it work first time. Small cell services margins are going to be so tight that extra site visits, or as we call them, ESVs, will need to be avoided at all costs. By adding this stage in, we can eliminate 90% or more of the problems that cause ESVs in the field. So the first step in this model significantly reduces the risk of project failure from a product side. Next comes the focus on the resources. For a model to be called intelligent, it needs to have a significant level of autonomy and be able to adapt and react to different scenarios without the need for significant human input. In the same way that FedEx can track a package at every stage of the shipping process, or Pizza Hut can tell you where your pizza is from the oven to the delivery guy's car to the front door, we need the same capability to track our resources. 
So the resource assignment and allocation tool looks at the jobs that are fed into its queue and determines from the characteristics of that job what level of technician or skill set is required. It then automatically locates the nearest qualified resource or resources and assigns the job accordingly. The same technicians then update their progress via handheld devices and smartphones, while at the same time they also upload pictures of critical steps so that we have a detailed visual record of the installation. And what's really cool with this system is that quality control can now be performed remotely on all jobs that they do, not just a handful. A major goal of this process is automation and elimination of time-consuming touch points where information is transferred from one process or team to another. This is one of the keys to cycle time reduction, lower costs, and ultimately operational efficiency. Lastly, and just as importantly, is collecting accurate and timely feedback on how the performance of our technicians is and how well we deliver against expectations. We've said several times that this is a people business we're in, and none is more important than the customer, and assuming we're working for an operator, the customer's customer, or the end user. Feedback from stakeholders is one of the main measurements of our success. Making it simple and straightforward for our customers to provide immediate feedback allows us to address issues immediately or reward excellence. Similarly, feedback is also a critical component in the ongoing development of our technicians, processes and systems as we strive to continually step up how we deliver our services. So in our discussion about the intelligent services delivery model, we talked briefly about the need to receive, test, stage, configure, and then ship the small cells and their associated ancillary installation materials to site. But in the same way that from a human resource perspective, we need to put the right skill set in the right place at the right time every time, the same applies to our non-human resources. Only this time, we need to ensure that we get the right tools and materials to the right place at the right time every time. The need for an extensive logistics infrastructure is therefore critical to success. Early on in this presentation, we talked about how the service providers need to improve in terms of intelligence, automation, flexibility, resiliency, efficiency, capacity, speed, and, and latency. Leaders in the logistics infrastructure exhibit very, very similar key characteristics, many of them built around process automation and operational efficiency. It's these same characteristics that our own logistics infrastructure needs to emulate in order to ensure that we've got the capability to handle tens of thousands of small cells going to nearly as many customers along with an extensive list of ancillary parts such as connectors, antennas, cables, splitters, cable ties, tape, hangers, conduit, and everything else. In fact, in the DAS world, some DASs we deploy have over 3,000 individual parts, and I don't mean a connector counts as, a connector, single connector counts as one. So it, we have thousands and thousands of parts that go out. Characteristics of an operationally efficient logistics organization include such things as total delivered cost management, automated logistics processes, end-to-end -end visibility, supplier and customer web portals, dynamic routing, variability management, comprehensive chain of custody tracking, integrated workflow with supply chain, integrated planning and execution platforms, and financial supply chain management. The PMI defines a project as a temporary endeavor with a defined beginning and end. So the process of deploying a small cell or a group of small cells from end to end at a customer's location would therefore be considered a project. They further define that a program is a group of related projects managed in a coordinated way to obtain benefits and control not available from managing them individually. So in our case, the deployment of tens or hundreds of thousands of small cells to different locations throughout the country is by definition a program. Now project managers often talk about the triple constraints, that is time, cost, and scope and that a change in one will create a change in one or both of the other two. Sometimes it's negative, sometimes positive. But in fact, time, cost, and scope are just three of the nine main areas that our project managers focus on. The full list is integration, scope, time, cost, quality, human resources, communications, risk, and procurement. Now, the reason for me giving you that table is not so much that it's you know, trying to do a 101 class on um, project management. It's rather it's to explain that while all these areas are critical to individual project success, program success requires us to look at some different areas. So from a program management perspective, the nine areas we need to consider start with governance. In governance, we look at the structure, the process, and the procedures to control operations and changes to performance objectives. Critical to governance, governance is performance monitoring through dashboards, KPIs, and metrics. Next is alignment. In alignment, we ensure that the vision, goals, and objectives of the company align with those of the program. In assurance, we verify, validate that the program adheres to standards and is meeting quality and safety requirements. 
In management, we ensure there are regular reviews and that there is a clear accountability and responsibility at all stages. Stakeholder management is critical, and not just external, uh, sorry, internal stakeholder um, internal stakeholders, but also external stakeholders as well. You can see on the screen there some examples of internal and external stakeholders in a small cell deployment. In integration, we ensure that all functional areas work together to deliver each project as operationally and technically efficient as possible. In finances, we track and monitor all program costs, direct and indirect. And we have monitoring systems and methodologies in place, such as Earn Value Management, or EVM, that can identify very quickly when schedule or costs deviate from the plan, and we can put remedy and mitigation plans in place. In infrastructure, we cover the essential support systems for the program. This area also covers such items as communications, version control, data storage, and IT, for example. In planning, we develop the high-level rollout plan. We bring together all the necessary information to cover all phases of the project lifecycle, including initiation, planning, executing, monitoring, controlling, and closing, the standard phases through a normal project. Lastly, in improvement, this is where we continually assess performance, research and develop new capabilities, and systematically apply best practices, learning, and knowledge to the program. So these are all the attributes you should look for in a PMO or program management office to demonstrate that they are ready and capable to manage a rollout, the likes of which we expect to see over the next two to three years for small cells. So next we'll take a look at the infrastructure that we need to support all these moving parts. Electronic data interchange, or EDI, is built around three core components, standardization, centralization, and automation. Now, there are many moving parts in our rollout program. They include such things as design, procurement, logistics, inventory, workforce management, staging and configuration, installation, network management, data security, and many others, all the way through to the holy grail that all services businesses strive for, that of recurring services revenue or managed services. Now, each functional area has its own set of processes that it needs to follow, and each of these inevitably require inputs from other functional areas. Similarly, each process produces an output that's also critical to an, as an input to another function. Now, we've said several times that one of our main goals is to increase operational efficiency. Cycle time is going to be a major challenge, and we've also acknowledged that reducing touch points and manual intervention is key to both time reduction and cost savings. And the Japanese have a word called muda, which incidentally is one of the three key concepts that Toyota uses in their production facilities. But in Lean and Six Sigma terms, MUDA is all about the elimination of waste. In our services business, one of the most wasteful activities we can have is in the manual movement of paperwork, documentation, results, and other data throughout the teams. Now, while not all touch points can be automated, particularly those where we need to be face-to-face -face with the customer, for example, a vast majority of them can, and that's where EDI comes in. Now, EDI is formally defined as the transfer of structured data by agreed message standards from one computer system to another without human intervention. But for us, EDI can be further defined as the transfer of data in formats that are compatible with the recipient's requirements from one functional group to another without human intervention. Successful implementation of an EDI infrastructure allows us to realize many benefits, the three key ones of which are cost efficiency, by significantly reducing the chance of duplication of effort and the time to transfer data, we can make immediate savings in per transaction cost while allowing administrative personnel to be redeployed to other greater value-added functions within the organization. Second is increased speed. Large volumes of data can be communicated from one system to another very quickly, which is even more critical when our technicians work remotely in the field. And lastly is improved data consistency and accuracy. EDI allows us to quickly identify and often eliminate many of the errors that result from human intervention in the process. Similarly, collected data can be validated for consistency, often while our technicians are still with the customer. This significantly reduces extra site visits, or ESVs, that can completely wipe out our already very tight margins. Lastly, as we spoke about a few slides ago, EDI is a critical component of our extensive logistics infrastructure. So now that we've spent time discussing the systems necessary to make the program successful, it's time to turn our attention back to the people that will make the program successful. Central to this theme is what we call the Small Cell Center of Excellence, or COE. And a rare break from one of our many three-legged stools that you've seen so far, the Small Cell Center of Excellence, or COE, is built around four main components. The first is knowledge management. 
which consist of the process, documentation libraries, and program development, where feedback, experience, and lessons learned are used to further refine our services product. Next is pre-sales and, and business development, which concerns itself primarily with the strategic planning and technical consultancy activities. Strategic planning helps us to stay on course or make adjustments in direction, particularly as the needs of our customers change or as the product lifecycle changes. For the technical consultancy team, the old adage that we have two ears and one mouth and that should be the ratio of listening to talking certainly rings true. Experience has shown us that we learn far more about how to meet our customers' ever-changing demands and needs by asking questions and listening to their answers than we do by spending the majority of our precious time with them going through exhaustive slide decks about who we are and what we can do. Third is training and labs. This is where all our resources, not just the field technicians, receive the hands-on training, boot camps and refresher courses they need to ensure that they're always equipped with the right skills and tools to do their job effectively. Many of these courses are delivered remotely via web-based learning systems and videos. And the COE ensures that training is not a one-way street. Employees are encouraged to share their experiences with others and participate in such things as train-the-trainer sessions or mentor programs. This is all part of doing everything we can to ensure that the product we deliver consistently meets customer expectations. The fourth part of the Center of Excellence is the Solutions Group. I think it was John Donovan of at t who recently said that invention is coming up with something new. Innovation is consummating that with the customer. Or, put in other words, taking a good idea and coming up with something that the customer is willing to pay for. The Centre of Excellence, and particularly the solutions group within it, are the team who tie together all the knowledge, skills, and best practices that we have as an organisation and turn this into innovative solutions that solve our customers' challenges. But this is not all. The COA also do lots of other functions. Some of them you can see on the screen there. They look at methodologies and templates, proof of concepts, custom solutions, newsletters, white papers, papers certifications, boot camps, some elements of governance, market trends, forecasting, KPIs, dashboards, they attend conferences, and so on. They have a very extensive remit of things they have to do. Lastly, and certainly not least, we now turn our focus to partnerships and the synergistic benefits that can be derived from them. The intention of this section is not to talk about partnerships with our subcontractors and vendors. After all, one of the keys we said earlier to success is that we need to self-perform the majority of our work. So our focus in this section is on the relationships we have with our customers and how they can be leveraged into realizing additional advantages that the two parties working together can have versus them working independently of each other. But before we get there, we need to look at the bigger picture and see how all this ties in together with the previous topics we've talked about. So a simple strategy map will help us do that. The foundation that we build the small sales program on is the continual improvement of our resources, which relies on three things. Our organizational capital, which includes such things as culture, leadership, objectives, values, teamwork, and recognition. Our information technology and tools capital, which revolves around leveraging our infrastructure and acquired knowledge, and integrating this into the way that we deliver our day-to-day -day services business. And lastly, our human capital. Our people are our main product. And key to this is the ongoing development and continual improvement of their competencies, along with providing them with the tools, contact, communication, community, and motivation to succeed. From a business perspective, this allows us to put the right people in the right place at the right time and at the right cost, which is a central theme in our intelligent services delivery model. From the resource level, we turn our attention to processes. We've spoken at length about our pursuit of operational excellence and how achieving this is contingent on a networked and interoperable delivery infrastructure that incorporates the tools and processes from such things as EDI, intelligent services delivery, logistics, and program management, for example. The impact of stakeholder management cannot be underestimated. On the internal side, we need to make sure we consider our colleagues, suppliers, and vendors, for example, but externally, we need to be acutely aware of the needs and wants of not only our customers, but also our customers' customers. Solutions innovation comes from all areas, but at its heart beats the center of excellence in all the functions that it performs. Lastly comes regulatory and social considerations. Small cells have many, many significant challenges that will need to be overcome. Some of them are regulatory, such as rights of way, leases, legislation, permitting, zoning, and so on. But some of them are going to be more social, particularly outdoor. Small cells will have an impact on the local communities in which they're deployed. Aesthetics, neighborhood disruption during installation, and public opinion are but a few areas that we need to carefully navigate as we go down the deployment route. But as well as looking at uh, how we can transform our organi organization internally, 
we need to be careful that we don't just take what I call an inside-in view and neglect to address the areas that our customers value. After all, it's our customers that will be purchasing our products and services. So to do this, we need to take what I call an outside-in approach and look at ourselves through their eyes. The first key to success we discussed in this presentation was the ability to scale. Put simply, our customers only want to pay for what they need when they need it, and variability in volume should not be met with a proportional variability in cost. By leveraging our ongoing relationships with our customers and our extensive knowledge of their existing networks, which in many cases we built for them, we're able to configure and personalize our service offerings to meet their specific needs rather than the needs of a general audience. As an example, many operators have national standards clearly, de clearly defining how they expect their systems to be deployed. But each market, and in some cases each engineer within those markets, has particular things they like to see, and they're unique to them. They may only be small things, such as a preferred signal threshold color or a labeling scheme, for example, but delivering the services product how they like it can make all the difference between getting work accepted first time rather than having it sent through margin sapping iterative rounds of rework. Considerable synergies can be realized by offering services that are directly compatible or services that can be seamlessly integrated into the customer's existing systems. We've talked at length about how a key component to operational efficiency is reducing cycle time. And much of that overall cycle time is in the control of our customers. The more we can do to make their job easier, the leaner the cycle time and the more they're going to value our contribution. Another trait that customers value is in how much they see us as a solver of their challenges or pain points. It can be simply viewed as the easy button concept, as I call it. They have a challenge, they call you, i.e. press the easy button, and the problem solved, on time, on budget, and meeting quality requirements with no surprises or headaches. And there are many tangible things that customers look for, but there are also just as many intangibles feelings or perception for that example, uh, for example, are hard to quantify, but they can make or break a deal irrespective of the tangible metrics that may be offered. Our customers, like us, like to do business with a brand they trust. How many times have you seen an item on eBay slightly cheaper than Amazon, but have gone with the Amazon purchase anyway because something just didn't sit well in your gut? Trust is earned and takes time to cultivate. Everyone and everything that the customer touches or sees can influence how the brand of the services provider is perceived. Now, while we're on the topic of brands, one of the most visible and money-earning brands in the world belongs to the great basketball player Michael Jordan. He was once asked why he played so hard night in, night out, even in what many classed as relatively unimportant games or when he was clearly ill. Now, his answer was eye-opening. He said that he went out every night with the thought that there may be one kid out there in the crowd whose parent had paid every penny they had for this one chance to see him play. And he said he never wanted to let someone go home and not feel like they saw the guy they perceived him to be the same model we should apply to our engineers. In our business, we sometimes talk about how it's the, odd, it's the one bad job that's remembered, not the thousand good ones. As services providers, we should never lose sight of the fact that our customers give the greatest work to those that they value the most. So, to wrap up this webinar, let's take a quick look back at some of the key points we've discussed. Data usage per user is exponentially increasing. The price per gigabyte is flattening, and so is the revenue for the operators, of course. Wireless networks need to improve in terms of intelligence, automation, flexibility, resiliency, efficiency, capacity, speed, and latency, and so do we. Suppliers need to provide their services at a lower delivery cost. We learned that the deployment cycle for outdoor small cells is over six months, and the deployment cycle for indoor small cells is around two to three months. Services revenue and margins per small cell will be low, so volume will matter in this business. And the existing approaches to macro, DAS, Wi-Fi, and so on are not efficient enough for small cells. Suppliers will need to develop new, low-cost, and efficient deployment models. And we looked at 10 key areas that for service providers will help us achieve small cells operational excellence, and for customers, a handy checklist, for evaluating potential service providers and service partners. The 10 things we looked at were financial health, scale, a large distributed workforce, self-perform is key, intelligence services delivery or ISD, an extensive in logistics infrastructure, large scale project management capability, EDI or electronic data interchange infrastructure, a small cell center of excellence or COE, and synergistic partnerships. And we also talked that 
about by delivering our services that maximize value to the customer, we can hopefully become what I call their easy button for their entire small cell related needs. So I'll finish with a final thought, uh, one from Winston Churchill, which being British, I suppose I've got to do. Um, Winston Churchill said, now this is not the beginning of the end. It's not even the beginning of the end, but it is perhaps the end of the beginning. I know that sounds somewhat confusing, but if we look at it, I'm sure you've seen small cells at the time. This is certainly not the end of small cells. It's not even the beginning of the end of small cells. But what I do hope is that this is the end of the beginning of small cells. We've spent the last two years talking about small cells um, and waiting for the advent of them to come, certainly from a services perspective. I think the time has come. We've done enough talking. It's now time to start putting these things in, in the volume we've talked about. So we're looking forward to this being the end of the beginning and starting to move into the middle phases of, of small cell deployment. And hopefully the end is a long, long, long way away for all of us. So that concludes our presentation. On behalf of Goodman Networks, I'd like to thank you for your time today. You can download a white paper of this by visiting our website, and it will also be made available, uh, emailed to you, I believe, for, uh, by RCR after this presentation. A recording of this presentation will also be available on RCR's YouTube feed as well in the very near future. Now, I'll open up the floor for some questions in a second, but as time is limited, if you do have any questions we don't address today, or if you'd like any further information on what we can do for you, you can always contact us by using the Contact Us button at the bottom of our homepage. With that, I'll hand control back over to Kyle at RCR and uh, open up the floor for any questions. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, we have seen a, a few questions come in. And again, we encourage everyone to submit their questions. You know, hopefully we'll get the, to them today. If not, like Jeff said, we uh, they will follow up. So the first question we had come in, Jeff, is uh, can you please explain and define the types of small cell applications Goodman Networks plans to deploy for the operators, such as femtocells, pickle cells, DAS, or other? Yeah, it's actually going to be all of them. The... Um... What we're seeing is that the, the operators and obviously the, the, the customers, the operators support are all going to multi-use. Um, femto cells make sense in, in a residential environment, for example. Small cells will make complete sense in probably small to mid-size enterprise. And DAS still has its place, certainly in the larger enterprise, large stadiums and things like that. And Macro still has its place. Macro is not going anywhere, as you saw from Project VIP. AT&T is still going to build another 10,000 of these things. So Macro is not going away, DAS, Wi-Fi. But what you're going to see is rather than one solution fit all, we're seeing solutions where they're blended. So we, in part of the buildings or the structures, we may see um, femto cells being deployed, for example, in a residential part. Um, in the sort of lobby area and, and meeting room parts, we may see small cells deployed. And then in other parts of the building, DAS makes complete sense. So um, we do we have to do them all because uh, HetNet or the heterogeneous networks that's, that are coming along, it's all about having multiple layers, multiple technologies, and putting the user on the right technology for whatever application they're trying to use. So um, I think to answer the question is you have to do them all, and you have to be experienced in them all. Um, and it's really finding a, a services partner that understands how all this fits together to be able to provide you with the solution that you need, not the solution that they want to sell you. Um, so it's, that's probably my answer to that one. Okay, thanks. Another one we had come in, um, aside from the lengthy time cycle mentioned in your presentation, what are just some of the key milestones that have to be met before we actually start seeing outdoor small cell deployments? Um, well, the first one, I think, or the biggest one is is that we need the carriers to, to work out exactly what it is they want to do. Um, in a lot of carriers' cases, they, their strategies are not 100% clear yet. Um, the downside for us, as we talk about, is the day the carriers decide what they want to do, they expect us as service partners to be ready the very next day to start deploying this stuff. Um, so that I think the bigger milestones that the, that's holding back volume particularly is that the, is the product itself. The, the most of the products that are available today, and I know there are some others that do both, but they're mostly 3G only, which is a limiting factor. Most of the operators would like these small cells to do 3G and LTE as well. Um, so we're waiting on products to be developed because anything we deploy today for th that's 3G only, will we have to be ripped and replaced later on to, uh, to be compatible with LTE as well. Um, I think the true capability of HetNet, that self-organizing, self-optimizing, self-healing is, is still a way off. 
Um, so the units we deploy today are just basically small base stations, which isn't the true HET net we're looking for. Um, again, same reason. Um, but I think the biggest reason we're not seeing the, the milestones we're looking for really are, are the operators to decide on a strategy and, and publicize it openly. at and is probably the one that's been the most vocal about that so far. Um, determine who's going to actually do the work and what work needs to be done. Um, and then obviously for them to start going through the process of selecting vendors and, and awarding that work. But key to all of this is we need something to put in. And uh, right now the products are just, you know, the, the hype is way ahead of the product, should we say. It's not that the products are falling behind schedule, they're not. It's just the hype around small cells is, is way ahead of the product availability right now. So we're, we're really waiting on, on the products and the operators. Okay. Um, another question coming in, does Goodman manage nationwide deployments and does do they also do indoor and outdoor deployments? Absolutely. Um, the, you, some of the acquisitions I spoke about earlier were when we looked at these 10 things a long time ago, one of them was that we need to have a nationwide workforce and that's why um, we acquired the multiband. Multiband has over 3,000 technicians with bands. And that's what we need. They deploy right now direct TV satellite services, but it's a very small step from putting a satellite dish on a roof and coax and cable and connectors and a box in a house or boxes in a house to stepping them up to go to small enterprise. and re it's, it's a small jump to retrain them to do small cell. Of course, they're going to continue to do the core business they've got. The advantage is it gives us literally 3,000 people across the, the country that can do this with vans, with other capability to climb ladders and everything else that we're looking for. So... Um, um, that covers a lot of the outdoor. Obviously, we do national um, outdoor work already. And then on the indoor side, um, we also acquired, we used to do DAS anyway as part of our business, but we expanded that by acquiring CSI. Um, and CSI was literally so we can expand our in-building DAS capabilities. CSI so far have deployed, I think, over 9,000 DASs in the last 12 years. So we've done so many of these things, both indoors and outdoors. But we do acknowledge that the challenges are going to be different. Um, you know, right? We we for, and and I think our customers are seeing that. You know, AT and T, for example, have separate teams doing the indoor part and the outdoor part. It's different tools. It's different term challenges. Outdoor is going to be a much greater challenge than indoor. But again, if you've got people who've got the experience from outdoor and indoor, and you can put them both together, because um, remember, these things don't work in isolation. They've got to work with the macro network as well. So it takes. You know, you need the skill sets to be able to understand how these small cells are going to fit into the macro network and also uh, and work with the macro network, but also the challenges around how to get around things like outside plant, you know, um, fiber trenching and fiber work outside is completely different from pulling cable inside, for example. Okay. Uh, do you see any unique antenna requirements considering the multiple small cell ap applications? Not right now, no. Um, the units that we're looking at now are being asked to deploy now. Are, we can deploy the same antennas and, and jumpers that um, that we use with DAS. Um, future solutions, I think, will will become a lot. Right now, the units are very much single operator or even single carrier, not operator. Um, it's one of the challenges for the industry is that we don't. It might be a small cell, but if you need one per frequency or one per carrier per frequency, a small cell suddenly becomes a big cell when you deploy AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile, and Sprint in the same location because you've got to put five or six or seven of these boxes on a wall. You might as well just put a full-blown base station in. So I think future development of small cells, you'll see aggregated um, aggregated solutions. They won't be quite DAS. I mean, DAS really isn't a small cell because the DAS just distributes signal. But we're starting to see DAS is fed by small cells um, as much as we're seeing them fed by macro cells. Um, but you'll also see uh, solutions where the, the, the radio resources, if you like, are hosted separately from the small cell itself. So the small cell will become more of an access point like Wi-Fi and the capacity will be held in a controller or some other remote location. One of the key benefits to this is that a lot of the small cells have very fixed capacity. For example, the ALU ones, I think, are, well, I don't think they're, they're 32 users. Um, but what's the point of having 32 users capability in a warehouse that might have three guys on pickle, uh, forklift trucks driving around all day? What I want is a cell that covers that warehouse, but if that capacity is not required there, I can move it into the office building that's attached to the warehouse. So if we detach the coverage from the capacity part, we can do that. So I think the next generation of small cells that are coming out will come out, um, and we're already seeing these, um, but they're just not approved yet by the carriers. They actually separate coverage and capacity, and so you have a controller that holds the base station capacity or pulls all that capacity, 
and the units act more like remote antennas that are multi-band, multi-frequency, multi-everything. So it's again, it's kind of we're taking the best of DAS and we're blending it, or the, the manufacturers are, and they're blending it with the best of small cell as well. Okay. Uh, what kind of data is considered good data in terms of traffic for designing small cells? Right now, we're, we're seeing um, the biggest data from a design perspective we're still getting from going out and doing benchmarking and um, CW test analysis. So we're not seeing that the process between DAS and small cells is particularly different. Obviously, indoors, where the there is limited data because most of these solutions are not deployed just for capacity, they're deployed for, for coverage. So there's no coverage inside a building, so we really don't know what's going to happen when we put this in there. What we do know is whatever is expected from a traffic perspective always seems to be considerably more once we deploy one of these. So if we, if we think we're missing out on 10% of traffic because a building doesn't have any coverage, when we deploy these things, it ends up being a lot more because when people suddenly realize they do have coverage, they start using services a lot more than they did before. But we do put a lot into collecting particularly the benchmarking data for, um, for coverage because the signal levels inside the building have a huge impact on isolating the indoors from the outdoors. If it's very strong inside, we have to put the cells a lot close together to be able to isolate you know, the building from the outside. If there's no coverage inside, we can get away with much wider spacing providing it meets the capacity requirements. So bigger questions are, what's the signal inside the building? What are the signals outside the building? So isolation. And then also, what's the user mix inside the building as well? A lot of these premises are not just one carrier users. They, unless their entire workforce is all on AT&T or Verizon, it's a mixed bag of tricks. You've got people on T-Mobile, Sprint, Verizon, and so on inside that building. It's being able to work with the customer and understand how many users are on the techno or on the carrier that is whose small cells you're trying to deploy. Okay, we have time for one more question. Uh, what do you feel will be the evolution of small cells from where they are today? Yeah, I think I talked a little bit about it. I think there's going to be a, um, the regular small cells have got their own place, which is where it's a fixed capacity. They're going to more or less replace the repeater business. Um, you know, repeaters just take a signal from outside and amplify it and indoors. Um, but they don't solve capacity challenges. All they do is just basically add coverage. Um, so there will still be a market for regular small cells, which are just pretty much a box with two wires on it, one for backhaul and one for power, that will handle small, very small enterprise. Um, but as I said, I think the future development of these things is going to pooled resources, where we separate coverage and capacity. Um, there's, it makes complete sense to not restrict a small cell to be being the the signal source for resources as well. All we want the box to do is basically provide the coverage and let a controller at the back end determine where that coverage is required. So you'll see, as we did in DAS and in macro to an extent, you'll see the equivalent of base station hotel, and it's not a new idea, but you're going to start to see this pooled resources concept for small cells. Further down the line, you're going to get HetNet coming, and that's the true um, plug and play, if you like. Um, the fact that we're not yet seeing it really, I mean, you can't go and buy a router or whatever from um, Best Buy and just plug it in without it working. Even if it says you can, you're still going to do something to it. Um, so whether that will ever materialize, I don't know. But um, f further down the line, we should be able to plug one of these units in anywhere, and it will automatically sniff the air, work out where its neighbors are, work out where it is, configure itself, download new firmware, and then just start functioning. And if one of its neighbors suddenly disappears, all the cells around it reconfigure. They adjust their power settings, their neighbors, their parameters to basically eliminate that gap. Capacity will be diminished, but the actual coverage won't be. So um, we're all looking forward to seeing self-organizing, self-healing, self-optimizing. It kind of scares engineers because it basically says we don't need you anymore. But um, like I say, I think those days are a long way off yet. We've got a, lot, a long, long way to go before we see that. And, um, and we're really looking forward to seeing what's coming along next. Okay, thanks, Jeff. I want to thank everyone for attending Thinking Big by Thinking Small, Keys to Successful Small Cell Deployments, presented by Goodman Networks. Uh, our presenter today was Jeff Cocking. I want to thank Jeff, and if anyone has any questions, uh, feel free to contact us, and we'll do our best at answering each one. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you.